And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. And today we're going to talk about women and depression, especially black women and depression. Today our guest is the hugely successful novelist, magazine editor, Benil D. Little, who has written a beautifully moving memoir about her own experience with the subject titled Welcome to My Breakdown and Welcome to Black America. Thanks, Carol. It's great it, to be here. It's it's so wonderful to have you. I just love, love, love the book. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that you know, in you know, reading the reviews that mm. not the reviewers, but ordinary people, mm. you know, po will post mm -hmm. on, and so many were so touched by this. Yeah. But I was struck by the one, uh, one person who wrote, but, but you know, it wasn't all about depression. You yeah. know, which right, <laughs> yeah. you know, is is interesting because your life. You have a hugely successful life. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about when you were writing the book, right. the arc of all that you you told. You know, and that that was really why I wanted to talk about it so publicly because we think if something looks good on the outside, then it's like that on the inside. And I really wanted to share with people that no, it's not about the size of your house and you know your bank account, um, and especially for people of color. Um, especially for black folks, we, we want to pray it away. We want to give it to God and, you know, n you know, not that you shouldn't, you know, get on your knees, sure. but when you're hit with something big, like uh, depression, you really need to get some professional help. You really need to deal with it. And we don't deal with it in this, in this culture. Right. Well, in, in our culture, it's sometimes perceived as a weakness. Absolutely. You know, the strong black woman. The... Absolutely. And you know what? I'm organizing to kill the strong black woman. We want to put her down. We're going to put, lay her to rest. We're going to lay her to rest. Right, have right. a nice wake. Because, you know. because people's lives are being devastated unnecessarily. Right, right. By depression, by mental right. illness, generally. Right. So, so let me just go through, uh, you know, the, uh, I love good hair. I mean, oh. you know, these are the books that she's written that are <laughs> fabulous about strong black women, <laughs> but, right. but who are living their lives in in a uh, proactive way right you know which is what i think you know, what you were trying to get at with all Absolutely. of your books there was good hair and then after that there was the itch and then it was acting out and then it was who does she think she is just a whole great series right. of of wonderful books and we Thanks. knew uh, that you had been an editor at People in Essence and you were living the lush life in New Jersey and had a husband right. and kids. Right. And inside all of that. Inside all of that was someone who just became a mess. Um, trying to do all of it, you know, traveling with the books, writing the books, raising the kids, you know, sort of trying to manage childcare, but also being like, you're kind of a full-time mother, which, you know, he's like, right. you got a full-time job and you got to, you know, you're trying to do the full-time being present, um, you know, husband needing to be in there with him, with his stuff, you know, which is as he's gotten older, when he was younger, when we were younger, I could kind of like leave him on autopilot. Right. But now, you know, and I talk about this in the book, all those things that happened to us, you know, he, him losing his father right after that, me losing my mom, the market crashing, losing a ton of money and then him being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Right. So life, life, life. So before all that happened, when the books were, you know, selling and, you know, all that, you know, life was pretty good. Life was good. It was, right. you know, you're, you're hectic, yeah. hectic, but it was good. And the kids were still young enough where, you know, you, they stayed where you put them. <laughs> You know, they didn't talk back. I remember that. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're going to this school. You're going to do this. OK. And now, you know. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, on this show, we always uh, talk, ask our, our guests to place themselves in black America, mm -hmm. where they grew up, what the influences mm -hmm. uh, were and or still are. Mm -hmm. But in your case, this is what the whole book is about. Yeah. And so this is the time to talk about Clara Little. Right. Clara Little was a force, my mother. And, 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 and the other thing about Clara, about my mother, is while she was a force and she was um, a renegade and she was smart and gutsy, she was also pretty um, much like so many black women of her generation who are invisible. And I wanted to talk about that. You know, she didn't have a college education. She didn't have a fancy background. Um, she had grit and she had native intelligence. 
and she had drive. And she also had a love of her black self. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she gave that to us, mm -hmm. which is hugely important. Right. Um, so, but there are lots of invisible black women just like her. Exactly. Well, you grew up in Newark. I grew oh. up in Newark. Right. In a, a, a loving community, mm -hmm. very much a neighborhood. And a lot of people say that's their favorite part of the book when I talk about, you know, my neighborhood and the characters. I know. In the because neighborhood. You, you use your novel as sense there to just, you can see all of yeah. your characters. Yeah. And just yeah. a wonderful job at. Right. You know, and, you know so, so the neighborhood, you know, so we're talking about, you know, I came of age in like the late 60s, you know, 70s, really, the 70s. And so, you know, we had. You know, there was Mr. Webb, who was a construction worker who was, you know, straight as an arrow Monday through Friday, but, you know, would get really drunk on the weekends. And there was Miss Jackie, who was a lesbian. We didn't use that word. We didn't even know that word. Right. But all these people were just embraced. No one ever said, oh, you know, Jackie's. Right. You know, it was just. And so it was really wonderful growing up like that. So your your mom, though, uh, you, you, you call yourself... I use the word construct because yes. I too am right. a total construct of my mother, right. you know, who gave me 100% attention and expectation mm. and all of that. And when she died, I went through the same tremendous grieving because when that light moves away from you, Ooh. Yeah. It changes really who you are when that person is oh no longer gosh. there. Talk to us. I love that light. I love that, the way you said that. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And, and you, it's the, always there. So you just take it for granted, mm -hmm. you know, and then when it's not there, you sort of like, what? What, what it's, happened? It's, it's, it's your unmoored. I felt like right. the ground um, was no longer beneath me. And it just, when it went on and on and on, then it was really scary. Yeah. So um, you thought, you felt that you were falling off of a... Oh, absolutely. Off of a cliff at that point when she... You, so we, you're very clear in the book that earlier on you had, um, you describe yourself as a child who often cried mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you were bullied as a mm -hmm. child. And so mm -hmm. all of this was going on and you had these bouts. But what, what was the difference you think about uh, the death of your mother that you right. really... I had a hard time getting over. Right, right. Because I've always been sort of melancholy. I've always been this creative person who was very comfortable living in her head. And, but when, <laughs> and it works. It and worked. It, and, it, and I figured out how to make a living out of it. <laughs> but when my mom died, it was, right, the light. It was also just having that person who really knows me, mm -hmm. like, can look at you and just like, mm -hmm, yeah, you know, just all of that. So it just felt like I was just alone, even though, you know, I had a family, I had a husband, a supportive husband, you know, kids. My dad started going down, you know, he has, he's dementia. full on dementia now, right. but it started happening after she died. I mean, she was a force. Right. And, you know, the family kind of fell apart, you know, like we would, you know, be together and my brothers and I, and, you know, everybody, you know, around her. But once that happens, it happened and it happens often, you know, it's kind of everything kind of so, and, and you, then you describe this long, long period of trying to mm. regain. Yeah. I mean, it's this whole thing of going to therapists and are you going to take medication and are you going to? Right. Uh, after all of that, because people are always looking for, well, what are the symptoms and what are oh, the, God. you know, what do you say to people if you, if you think that they're, gonna, they're going this way to clinical depression? Of right. Not just sadness or grieving, but. Right. Um, so in my case, it just wouldn't lift. It just was every day. Like, you know, with sort of like sadness, you, you can have days where you're not and, you know, you can have these lifts, but I just never had lifts. It was mm -hmm. just black. And I, I felt like, what I felt like was I was in a hole, in a hole that was, it was all um, dirt. I was surrounded by dirt and I couldn't get out, you know, so I'd get my hands on the sides, on the walls, but you know, it's dirt. So we would just, you couldn't get a grip. Mm -hmm. literally. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get my head up above that hole. Um, so I think that when, when you just, it's every day and it goes on, you know, the clinic, I think they say, the experts say like two weeks, you know, it went on a lot longer than that for me. I, I, I you know, but I think, you know, three, four, you know, weeks, a month, you know, I think then you, you have to 
seek some kind of help. Some kind of help. Yeah. And, and, and do you think that talking it through, well, everybody's different, of course, mm. but do you think that talking it through for something like clinical depression will, will work, or do you think that medication, well, we don't want to prescribe for right, everybody, right. certainly, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, I went to, and I talk about the different therapists I went to. The first guy um, felt that we could do it with just talk. He was an analyst, so it was deep and, you know, going back to the womb kind of thing. Right. And while I enjoy <laughs> therapy, that's probably a weird thing to say, but I, because I like to deconstruct, but in that, at that moment, I just didn't have the energy. Right. And it was like expensive too, um, to do that, to commit to months and months and months of deconstruction. And I had already, it was seven months before I actually saw somebody, you know, saw it So that's out. seven months of every day. Yeah, of every day, uh, of every day. Of not being able to get out of the... Every day. I'd get up to walk the dog and right. take my kids to school. Right. And, and then I'd go it. back and get in the bed. Right. And then, and I kept the woman who, I took care of my mother the last six weeks of her life in my house. Yes. So I had, I had help. I had um, this wonderful woman helping me. And so I kept Sonia for like a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize it. I mean, yeah. I was like paying her the same amount that I was paying, when she, which is one of the reasons she was so fantastic, <laughs> you know, but I was, I didn't even realize it. I was that out of it. So she would cook and, you know, clean up and she just kind of ran the house so that I could just kind of be, I, I mean, even if she, if I couldn't have had her, I probably, things would have just, I don't know what would have happened. Right, right. You know, I would go to like a teacher conference. I remember this and wouldn't remember a thing right. that they said. You know, just sit there kind of like... So that's a part of the, the depression, too, is just a, a numbness to, yeah. to yeah. What's, what's going on. It's a, and, and I guess in some, in some cases, it's just uh, wiring. Yeah. Uh, that's, it's not your fault. You right. Know? I mean, Absolutely. And I think that's what so many people feel. Oh, my goodness, you know, I can't do this. I can't afford right. to do anything about it. And it's right. my fault and I just have to pull myself out of it. Right. And so right. much time is lost. Exactly. And there's no pulling out. And so, so what happens is, so then you, you drink too much or you drug or you shop or you socialize or you, you know, there's all these things that people, I mean, the drinking people probably recognize and probably drugs, but people right. don't recognize the other stuff is also a symptom of running away. You know, the over socializing, the spending too m money you don't have. Right. You, you, you know, just running, 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 running. You know, that's a that's a sign that something's not quite right. If you can't sit with yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and be okay. Yeah, there there's this effort of now that we have social media to mm -hmm. to virally, in a way, uh, get the word out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the uh, this wonderful uh, uh, hip hop artist uh, and poet. Um, uh, has uh, done a, a clip. Let's take a look at that. And on the other side, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. My mind has a mind of its own and it won't leave well enough alone. And my brain can't control itself. So I need you to help me and be patient. Don't go. Oh wow! Now I haven't seen that. Right, right. You'll have to watch the yeah. whole the whole yeah. thing. We'll we'll send it to you. Mm -hmm. But but um, she uh, suffers from bipolar, mm -hmm. which is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there are all mm -hmm. of these you know mm -hmm. gradations mm -hmm. and yeah of right. of of, of Ill, illness. Um, and so she's what she in her clip is trying to do is to show people the stages that she went through, and it was from popularity and being being an extrovert to total isolation. Right. Uh, eating disorder, et cetera. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. that, I, that mm -hmm. stream mm -hmm. that most people go through, and I mm -hmm. think that for parents of children, I always you know, l keep on the lookout for that sort of thing, that mm -hmm. when your child is closing the door and mm -hmm. not socializing. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, the piece that you know, is the bullying piece too, which mm -hmm. is very, very important, that yeah. especially in social media now, yeah. where, oh. where young kids are committing suicide yeah. because they've been bullied right. online. Right. And you were bullied in mm -hmm. person in mm -hmm. school over mm -hmm. a long period mm -hmm. of time. Yeah. And you know, bullying, uh, I didn't know this at the time and just learned this in the last few years, sort of can change who you are. Mm. And uh, it was pretty intense. Um, and it's all part, I talk about it in the book because in the context is how my neighborhood changed after the riots. 
And so we went from this sort of stable, working class, striving community with intact families to the riots happening and people who had families like ours left and moved to various suburbs, which eventually also became bad neighborhoods, but that's a whole other story. Um, and so the people who moved in were had less. And all I mean by that, I mean less um, financial stability, oftentimes single parents, and uh, and move and, and so we didn't grow up together. So when you don't grow up with somebody, you you know you saw somebody like me who only had fifty cents more than the people who moved in. We're not talking about you know right, the Huxtables sure. here, and um, and so there was a lot of that, and I didn't understand it. You know, like this like picking on me, talking about my clothes, talking about you know how I talk, talking about you know. Well, your mother always told you they're just jealous, right? right? But she didn't explain what that meant. Ah. Thankfully, she didn't explain what that meant. I think that if she had gone into like a sociological explanation, right. it would have set me up to be a different kind of person, to be like conscious, you know, the stuff that I write right. about, to right. be class conscious and all that stuff. And and what she did was, and that's what I mean, she was so smart in this way. You know, and so I would say, jealous of what? And she wouldn't answer me. Because to me, I'm wearing like corny clothes. Right. right. I wanted she had like, you really dressed from Lord and Taylor. Right, right. That kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, classic clothes because it they lasted longer. Right. You know, they you just buy a coat. Besides, that was her ideal, right? And that was her ideal, exactly. And so, you know, there were girls who had like Jack, wet look jackets from right. learners and shoes from bakers. And I wanted that. So when they would say, you know, when they would pick on me, I'm like, no, but I want Yeah, that. yeah, exactly, exactly. So it was pretty confusing. Yeah, but the, bu- the bullying went, went, yeah, went, went on. on. Yeah, you have a terrific blog, and I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about, because you've been writing about the, mm. the current uh, instances of waking up day after day where people who may not, usually be susceptible to depression Mm. are getting depressed and getting worried and anxious about what is going on for themselves, for their children, for their whatever. And what what you wrote on this blog was, I will not watch any more videos of people being murdered. I stopped in November of last year, 2015, when Laquan McDonnell was shot 16 times by Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke. This year, in 2016, 560 unarmed black and brown people have been killed by police officers. 560. Of course, all lives matter. I love Mm. the way you put Mm. this. The difference is that all lives aren't at risk when stopped by the police because of a broken headlight. 12-year-old white boys aren't shot down in playgrounds by police. All lives aren't taken or even threatened when encountering the police. And I suggest that you go to her blog, BenildeLittle.com, for, you know, these sort of insights. So so coming from a person who has depression and witnessing all of these mm-hmm. events, talk. Yeah, you have to protect yourself. That's a big thing that I, that I learned. I just can't go there. I don't watch the news. I read the Times on the weekend. Right. Um, I listen to NPR. Uh, the other day, when um, the whole convention thing with the, um, uh, the Trump wife stealing um, Michelle's, uh, Mrs. Obama's um, uh, speech, you know, I, I was trying to find it from the beginning because I didn't know all the details. Sure. So I'm hitting like the AM. So right. I got to 770 and I didn't know that was Fox or some right, right. to the right. And, you know, I'm listening because I want to catch up. I want to know what happened. I want the news. I don't want right. these opinions. And, you know, now news, it's the opinions exactly. and the news, it's all melded together. Yes. It's so one thing. It's right. one thing. But so I listened for a little while and then Peter King started with his madness and I just, I shut it off. I, right. So I have to, um, I, I protect So when people are like, oh my God, but you have to see this one. You have to see Minneapolis. No, I really don't because I can see all that in my head right I can hear the little girl I didn't hear the tape I can hear it I don't need I don't say when she said I'm with you Mm -hmm. mommy don't 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 worry a four-year-old yeah yeah Yeah. um uh, Terry Williams who is has written about uh uh blacks and uh, mental illness Mm -hmm. and suffered from depression Mm -hmm. herself uh, has uh, has been talking about pr- the same thing that you are, of protecting yourselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we have a clip. Let's take a look mm-hmm, at Terry. Mm-hmm. The reality is helping people to understand that um, 
all of us inherit the unresolved pain, wounds, trauma, and scars of our parents. It's like, it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just what is. Um, and so, I, I just wanted to say something in everyday language, so you, you would get it. That if you, there's so many of our kids who are, are an adults as well, who see somebody shot and killed or stabbed right in front of them, and they get up and go to work or school the next day like they didn't just see that. I just talked to a woman rescued the other day whose home had been burglarized. She hadn't been to see a therapist. Never, never occurred to her. I was like, run, like your life depends on it, you know? So I think it's, it's just, it's, it's creating a, a sanctuary. I speak at a lot of corporations and I speak to um, just a lot of people in general to just share what the signs are, what, the, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. Um, and creating a safe space for people to take a layer of their mask off and share their stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and taking that mask mm -hmm. off is what you did so oh, yeah. wonderfully and welcome to my, mm -hmm. to my breakdown. Um, I, I think, again, going back to black women mm -hmm. and the strong black woman uh, meme that uh, so many of us uh, mm -hmm. subject ourselves to. Mm -hmm. So we... And so many of these things where blacks are, African Americans are like 20% more likely to experience mental illness, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. And women, of course, more so than that. Mm -hmm. And you say that you're ready to uncover, lay her to rest? Yes, absolutely. Talk to us a, just a little bit about that, of, mm -hmm. of how you see the path mm -hmm. for doing that. Well, how I see the path. It's, you get a lot of resistance because the, what you have to do, just like what we have to do with, with all this racism and white privilege, you have to decon deconstruct the institution. And the institution was, we're on this plantation. And we're, we're, we got our babies on our back and we're picking cotton and it's 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so we get this passed down. Girl, you better get it together. I did, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you can do it too. And you better buck up and you know, all that, right? That's what we hear. Right. Again, thankfully, my mother, who worked like a dog, 32 years of nights, Night. Right, as a night nurse, right? Right. And then was the PTA president, the right. block club leader, the, no kidding, the dead And scrubbed mother, her house. And scrubbed her house till it was, so that, I think that was a form of, I don't think, I know, looking back, her anxiety, you know, she was working it out, doing all that, ironing my dad's boxer shorts, right. really. Right, sure. So, um, so she would say to me, though, when I became an adult, and, you know, and she just got sicker and sicker, she, she would say to me, don't do what I did. I worked myself to, to death. I work myself to this point. Go and get a massage. Get some help to clean your house and to take care of your kids. You know, so I had that. I was fortunate enough to have to, that she gave me that permission. But Terry is absolutely this whole mask thing. We worked together years ago at Essence and, you know, closely. And I had no idea. And she had no idea. So that when, you both had. Right. Depression. And so when her book came out, I reached out to her when my book came out. And we've just had this, our relationship is just so beautiful because, and we don't see each other much, right. but when we do or talk to each other, it's, it's sisters for real because there is no mask. And that's what we have to do, whether you have depression or not, we have to get rid of all this because we are each other's savior. Nobody else is coming mm -hmm. and we don't need anybody else to come. But if we can be real with each other, with our pain, with our joy and all of that, we're going to be okay to quote Kendrick Lamar. We can be okay. <laughs> right, right. And, and so do you see, I mean, certainly books like yours and work like Terry's, you know, takes us in that, in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, but what about our young people? What do you say to, to our teenagers who are getting mm -hmm. bullied, to witnessing all of these, uh, you know, the vicious crimes against their black bodies is, mm. you know, the way they perceive it? You know, it's a, it's, that's a tightrope because you don't want to make them so afraid. You don't want to make them lose hope. You know, I have a 15-year-old son who's six feet tall. You know, right. he looks like a little boy still if you look in his face. But, you know, he can be... So in our neighborhood, when he leaves the house, I'm, you know, every time. Like last night, he was out with friends, uh, went to a movie late. And uh, Cliff woke up, my husband woke up at like midnight, before it's not home. I mean, just like out of a sleep, like sat up, you know, before it's not home yet. Right. You know, so you, you know, what do you say? You try to like, you try to be honest with them, but not lose hope. 
you know, not to lose hope and, and, and to kind of build them up inside. Right. right. Every day. I Every love day. You so much. Right. You, you have to. Yeah. Have to build them. Toni Morrison talked about, you know, one thing she did do as a mom when her sons would walk in her face, you know, just, just stop what you're doing. Just, and I do, I do that. I do it just, I mean, it comes natural, but if it doesn't come natural for you, you know, you got to give them, especially our boys, our girls are, you know, it's, I, 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 I have a girl too, and I find it easier to relate to her just because she's also, right. we're the same gender. Boys, because they seem so tough, and they're just the opposite. You know, they're not tough. you got to, like, just love them up. We, we always, in closing, and I hope you'll come back on the show mm. and talk some more about all of this, uh, uh, ask our guest to finish the statement, uh, the strength, the power of black America lies in. I think our compassion, our ability to really put ourselves in other people's shoes, I think, you know, and I'm not talking about South Carolina forgiving the boy as soon as it happened. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our inherent Africanness. Um, and I, th- and I, I think that's it. Our compassion, our ability to, and we've gotten so far away from it because mm-hmm. we don't live and we don't grow up in the same communities anymore. You know, you hear this all the time where the garbage man lived next to the doctor. We did live in communities like that. Right. You know, right. and so the aspirations weren't, the aspirations were not um, to be a drug dealer or to be a rapper. You know, right. not that there's anything wrong with being a rapper, but, you know, we had, we had strength in those numbers and, and we developed compassion and you only do that by having uh, differences, mm-hmm. you know, to be able to see mm-hmm. each other's humanity. And I think that that's, that's our strength. Okay. Well, we thank you so much for being with us thank and for, you. thank you for your wonderful books, thank your you. novels and your memoir. Thank you I so recommend much. welcome to my break <laughs> breakdown to, to everybody for uh, depression and bipolar support. You can call the depression and support Alliance helpline at one 800 1-800-826-3632. And uh, thanks to you all out there, too, for joining us today. We'll see you the next time. I'm Carol Jenkins, and the program is Black America.